reading today is from Jeremiah chapter 4. At that time it will be said to this people and to Jerusalem, a hot wind comes from me out of the bare heights of the desert toward my fortune. Not too big or when. A wind too strong for that. Now it is I who speak in judgment against them. For my people are foolish. They do not know me. They are stupid children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil, but do not know how to do good. I looked on the earth, and lo, it was waste and void. And to the heavens, they had no light. I looked on the mountains, and lo, they were quaking, and all the hills moved to and fro. I looked, and lo, there was no one at all, and all the birds of the air had fled. I looked, and lo, the fruitful land was a desert, and all its cities were laid in ruin before the Lord, before his fierce anger. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be a desolation, yet I will not make a full land. Because of this, the earth shall mourn, and the heavens above grow black, for I have spoken, I have purposed. I have not relented, nor will I turn back. The second reading today is Psalm 14. Fools say in their hearts, there is no God. They are corrupt, they do abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. The Lord looks down from heaven on humankind to see if there are any who are wise, who seek after God. They have all gone astray. They are all alike perverse. There is no one who does good. No, not one. Have they no knowledge, all the evildoers who eat up my people as they eat bread, and do not call upon the Lord? They shall be in great, they shall be in great terror, for God is with the company of the righteous. You will confound the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. Oh, that deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of this people, Jacob will rejoice, Israel will be glad. The epistle reading today is from 1 Timothy chapter 1. I am grateful to praise Jesus our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Jesus Christ. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in time, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Gospel reading today is from Luke chapter 15. And all the tax collectors and sinners were coming to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over the sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Or that woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, leave the house, and search carefully until she finds it? When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for 
for I have found the coin that I have lost. Just so, I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. As we look at scripture this morning, we have a really great teaching moment. Because so often we look at scripture and we talk about the Old Testament and the New Testament. And we think that they're separated. That somehow the old is just that old. Something to be packed away, looked at every once in a while. And that the New Testament is the only thing to follow. Jesus was very clear about this though. He said he didn't come to change anything about the Old Testament. But came in order to fulfill it. To make us understand. And this is one of those interesting times because when we read in the Old Testament a lot of times, what do we hear about? We hear about that God, right? That God that's going to punish in the seventh generation. That God that looks to a city and you got to argue with because there's one good person in the city, will you say it? We hear about this awful God that I've not met. And part of the problem is we hear only the negative stuff and we don't catch the pieces of prophecy that bring hope. And every one of them have it. Let me show you what I mean. Jimmy, can you roll us a headline? Jeremiah has all this desolation he's talking about. But there's one verse in all of what he's saying in this particular prophecy. For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be desolation, yet I will not make a full end. In other words, there's something to come beyond this. Right? When you listen to the Old Testament, I, I always get a kick out of this. The Israelites, when they move into the promised land, are given the command to go into these cities kill every man, woman, and child, right? Over and over again, we hear that. And over and over again, we hear a chapter or so down the line how they're in trouble. And what are they in trouble for? For marrying people of that land. But they were just praised a chapter ago for going in and killing every man, woman, and child. Anybody else see a contradiction here? If I kill everybody in a town, how do I marry? You have to remember that his scripture was written. It was written from human perspective, human understanding. So they go in and they're all joyous, and a few years down the road, they realize, oops, that's not what God was really calling us to do, and you know, really, that's not what we did. I mean, anybody else here Think God would look at something and say, okay, you know what? I don't like Baldwin anymore. Go ahead and kill every man, woman, and child there, and you can have the town. Not the God I've met. But notice how in this prophecy, there's a piece of hope. Yet I will not make a full end. He does the same thing in the psalm. All of that desolation in the psalm. There we go. And at the end of it, he says, Oh, that the deliverance for Israel would come from Zion. When the Lord restores the fortune of its peoples, Jacob will rejoice and Israel will be glad. In other words, there's some hope here that these people who follow God will get it, will start to understand what God is really talking about and come forward and change. That there will be this relationship that God is upset right now. But just like us, how, how many folks here have children? You ever been mad at your kids? Right? Have you ever been so mad that you wanted to give them away? <laughs> and yet, you still love them? Have you reconciled that? Oh, or if God can, or if we can do that, how much more so can God do? And there's this interesting thing that comes up out of this, because God wants to have this relationship. God wants to look into your eyes and see as much love coming back 
as what was going out. Because just like our children, we don't stop feeding them because they've done wrong, do we? Maybe for a very short period of time, but you know, we don't look at a three-year-old and go, that's it, you're done. You're on your own, get out. Right? You got this agreement going? I need a thumbs up, so we're doing good. We don't have that relationship with our kids, so why would this God have that relationship? Well, most of us have a problem. Who here has a mirror in their house? You ever look at it? Unfortunately, why, why unfortunately? You don't like what you see. It, it, it's not the same color it used to be. And there's wrinkles now. And, you know, you're not 20 anymore. You can see every scar, everything that's went wrong. You see, we have these invisible mirrors at our house, too. The ones that look at our lives and see every sin, every mistake we've ever made. I bet I don't have to go through and sit down with any of you and have you, you know, figure out for you what your sins have been, do I? Anybody here need me to point out all the mistakes for them? You, you probably have that list pretty well down, don't you? Did you say you do? Oh, oh, Mary, well, I'll pray for you. It's going to be a long day after this change. <laughs> We all know what we've done wrong. And we keep that list. And it's awful hard to look at that list and then think of this righteous God that's given all this stuff to us, that's blessed us so much to say, how can God give me one more thing? I wouldn't give me one more thing. I wouldn't have that type of forgiveness. And we start to shrink back. God can't possibly love me, so I'm not going to go to church. I'm not going to have that relationship. I'm not going to try to engage in that because I'm not lovable. I'm not worthy. Well, then we hear Paul. And I need to give you a little background on Paul. You can go ahead and roll it ahead. We'll be touching on this in just a few seconds. Paul is probably one of the most prolific and beloved apostles that we have in the Christian church. He is the apostle of all apostles. He started more churches. We have more books by him than by any of the other disciples. We follow his words diligently. We read them every week. But you need to know something about Paul. Before Paul's conversion, Paul had a pretty good life. He was an upstanding Roman. And not just an upstanding Roman, but of the elite. And on top of it, he was also an upstanding Jew and part of the elite. In fact, the Jewish heritage, the Jewish religion, gave him papers that said, here, get rid of those Christians. Do whatever you want to them, but make sure they're not here tomorrow. And he did. He went out and he killed them, he crucified them, he punished them, he did everything he could to try to get rid of the Christian faith. This is the man we hold in high regard. And then his conversion comes. And you hear about his conversion and the fact that God came into his life and forgave him his ignorance. Forgave his sins. And here's the thing. The why he forgave. Read the passage with me. But for that very reason, I receive mercy so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ displays the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. I just thought of the fact that I should have put that on a card for everybody to take home today. Because isn't that how we feel? that we've done so much that God can't possibly love us, and yet this passage shows that even the most unlovable can be forgiven. 
Because our God wants to show that there's this relationship with one. So we come to the gospel this morning. And I love this passage because this passage really is church. You're all here this morning and I'm preaching at the choir. Why do I say that? Because you're here, so you're kind of trying to seek out that relationship, aren't you? You're trying to find that forgiveness. To find some way of changing and transforming the life you have. If for no other reason, then you're afraid of what might come. But here's the problem. Who here gets upset when God doesn't do what we ask? You have that prayer, right? My prayer is usually go something like this. It's a laundry list. Dear Lord, if you'd only do it this way, that way, and the other way, and do it exactly the way I think, then everything would be great. Just please get it done. Anybody else have that prayer that happens? Right? When do we pray? Do we pray when everything's going great? When we come to church? A lot of times we don't pray in rejoicing. Who here gets up in the morning and their first prayer in the morning is, Dear Lord, thank you for my spouse. Dear Lord, thank you for the kids that are about to be an earthquake in your home. By the way, if you're on Facebook, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Dear Lord, thank you for the trouble I'm going to have today. So I remember who's in charge. See, typically when things are going good, we don't do it as often. How many people here, when the times get bad, hit their knees real quick? Right? You hear somebody's got cancer, first thing you do is pray for them. When you hear somebody's getting married, do you pray for them? Or do you just put down, save the date? <laughs> right? God looks down on God's fold, on God's sheep, and looks around and says, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. we're missing a couple. I got to go find the two that are lost. Right? God seeks out that relationship when we get lost. Does God have to spend extra time coming up and finding out where you're at today? No, you're here. Right? And if you're lost and you're here, great. This is the perfect place to be. But when we expect that God's going to do something extra special, because we showed up today, God's going to feed me a special meal just because I came to church. I was good today. I've done what I was supposed to do, right? When we go to work and we do what we're supposed to do, what happens? We get paid. When I came to church, it's where you're supposed to be. You got a three-year-old, you know this feeling too. Right? A 16-year-old. <laughs> and we'll revert back every so often, right? We wait for God to give us something special, but this passage looks at us and says, you know, there'll be more rejoicing in heaven. You start crying already? Okay. Good. I, I thought maybe that was the pause. It, okay, I, I need to pause the sermon for just a second. You have to understand what's happening here. Every time Evie has looked at me since she has been born, she screams the minute she sees me. This is not normal for me with children. Normally I pick them up and I stop crying. So we're having a. We're, we're trying to make it so the baptism is going to go well. <laughs> But this relationship that God has, getting back to the sermon, that God is seeking, God pays special attention and looks for us when we're lost. Can we get there when we're coming to church? 
Anybody here ever been lost even though you have faith? Usually I feel like I'm, I've got the map, right? I've got the X on it says you are here. The unfortunate part is everybody forgot to put the road maps and everything else on there, so it's just a blank, blank piece of paper that says you are here. That's kind of how I feel in my faith sometimes. I read scripture and go, uh, what? I don't see how that pertains. But part of the problem, and the reason I brought up what I did at the beginning, was because if you follow this through, from the very beginning in the story that God has with creation, they didn't get it. But there was a piece of hope. There was a piece of hope left in every prophecy. Every time something happened, God floods the world, and there's hope left over in that ark. And God keeps coming back if we keep getting lost over and over and over again and giving us another piece of hope. And finally, God gave us Jesus. And this is why the New Testament becomes so important. Because it explains what God was trying to do from the beginning. Let this sink in for a second. The New Testament explains what God was trying to do from the beginning. So when we read about this wrathful God, we're lost. When we sit down and think all God does is waits for us to mess up so that we can be punished, we're lost. Because that puts us in a place where we're looking at the list of like God can't love you not possible. And what the truth is, is when we're lost, God is searching more diligently than ever. I don't worry about my two or four year old this morning. I know where they're at. Not only can I hear them, I know their mother's around. I know they're safe. Do you know what I get afraid? When I can't hear them. Right? Everybody knows when the house goes silent and there's a few and a four year old in it, something's happening. You don't want it. What makes you think God doesn't know that when we go silent, when we pull away, that something's not wrong? That our spirits are broken. That we are in need of more help than we can possibly imagine. Which takes us right back to Paul's letter today. When we receive that mercy, when God sees us out and says, oh, there you are, and brings us back, we're there to be the example. To be that example of God's love for so regardless of where you're at, whether you're at the best place possible and we're doing the baptism, or you're at the darkest point in life, God is present, waiting, just wanting to be a part of your life. The question is, will you respond? Will you step forward? Will you say yes? And will you allow God to be a part of your life? It's difficult to look at an authority and say, yeah, I'll tell you what's going on. You know, the funny part that I've always had, my grandfather pointed this out to me when I was a teenager. What is it that God doesn't know about you already? What you did last night, God knows. What you did when you were 13, God knows. And yet God is seeking you out. God wants the relationship. For one reason and one reason only. God is the ultimate love. God created you specifically. There is a plan and a purpose for your life. And there's not a one of you 
that is an important and the noise makers over there the one that's going to make noise in November to me to the wisest of our congregation you've each been created with heartfelt love and a desire to be in relationship all we got to do So I'm going to make everybody uncomfortable for the last end of this particular sermon. Everybody that's normally here knows why I do this, or wonders why I do it sometimes. But there are different modes for prayer. We pray hold our hands, right? This is to show servitude. The hands of the slaves are bound and walked together. Is this love? Is this anybody know what this looks like? You're gonna take a chance. What does every little child do when you reach for it? Reach it back, don't you? Please rise. For those of you who are able and not holding children at the moment, please raise your hand. Repeat that. Dear God, Dear God, we know your love. We know your love. We seek your presence. We seek your presence. We thank you. We thank you that you created, that you created each one of us. Each one of us. Especially, especially in your love. In your love. Your wisdom. Your wisdom. Your mercy. Your mercy. Take our lives. In our lives. Make them, make them yours. Walk with us. Walk with us. Love us. Love us. Forgive us. Forgive us. Amen. Amen.